this idea of entity relationship modeling and creating these diagrams. And we said these diagrams uh, kind of work in two directions. First, they are a mechanism for us to be able to capture business requirements from our business users and document them in a way that is both easy enough for them to understand and it's, it's easy to explain, but also that is specific enough and has enough technical nuance that it is going to be kind of usable to our more technical people to create these, uh, to, to create the actual database itself, create the tables, create the attributes, create the relationships and things like that. So creating these diagrams we, we discussed is an iterative process where as the business user is describing what they need out of this database, we're gonna write it down, we're gonna use our ER modeling grammar to create this diagram that has some technical specificity to it, and then we're going to use that diagram to explain it back to the user and explain the assumptions we made and see if those were good assumptions or not. And often we're gonna find that we'll need to tweak and change some things and we'll kind of go back and forth a little bit until we have a model that we all agree on and then we'll transform that model into our SQL DDL code. So the ER diagram, the ER model works in both directions to explain to our less technical users, but then to give direction to our more technical users. And we started off with a pretty simple and imprecise presentation layer model here. And this one described a short vignette uh, we call Dave's dog wash, right? Where we have some, uh, some, a point, some customers that own dogs and dogs are groomed by employees. Employees work at locations and dogs can be dropped off at locations, right? So this was our very first attempt at capturing some business use cases and business requirements in a pretty simple ER diagram. And then Last week, we made it a little bit more valuable, a little bit more precise. We added all of our attributes and some special symbols to the attributes to, uh, to, to describe whether attributes are stored or derived, like age is a derived attribute that we're going to derive from a stored value like date of birth. And we said some attributes are mandatory if they're filled in circles or optional if they are empty circles. And, uh, we might have attributes that are unique identifiers and we uh, represent that by underlining the name of the attribute. We also talked about our structural constraints of cardinality and participation. We said that a, uh, an entity has optional participation. We're going to have a circle here. If it has mandatory participation, we put a line and then we had our either one or many uh, cardinalities on either side of the diamond on the diagram that represents the relationship, right? So now we're getting to the point that this diagram is really giving us some technical direction uh, that we can use to create these uh, tables in our database. So we talked about these notations last week, how we represent entities with these boxes that just have a single line around them and a special type of entity called the weak entity that must depend on a base or a strong entity in order to be uh, in existence or in order to be uniquely identified. And we represented that with a box that has a double outline, our normal relationships or a diamond with a single outline or the identifying relationship, which is the special relationship between a base entity and a weak entity with this double diamond. And then of course, all the different types of attributes as they can be optional, mandatory, uh, unique identifiers or uh, discriminators, partial keys, how we represent all these things. So this is the grammar that we've been uh, using so far. And we talked about how to read these diagrams using what we call the look across notation, where we uh, get the participation and cardinality for an entity by reading across the relationship. So in this case, we would say a plant undertakes a minimum of zero. So we read the participation constraint across the relationship and a maximum of many projects or going the other direction, a project is undertaken by a minimum of one and a maximum of one plants or exactly one plant in this case. Okay, so this is how we read those diagrams. We look across the relationship, the arc, which captures if an entity is participating in more than one relationship, 
Do we want to say that it has to participate in either one or the other, or not, but not both, and that's the exclusive arc? Or do we want to say that if it's going to participate in either, it has to participate in both, and that's the inclusive arc? Or this kind of straight across line here says that it has to participate in either one or the other or both, right? But it can't not participate in any relationship. And then we're also going to be introducing this idea of maximum cardinality, where we're able to capture that uh, an entity participates not just a maximum of many times, but a maximum of some actual number of times. So we said that in relational data modeling, we are going to think of our entities as relations. So relations, entities, and tables, all really kind of the same thing, just at different levels of technical specificity. So in relational modeling, we're talking about relations, which are basically a two-dimensional table made up of rows and columns. And the very first row or the very first tuple in our relation just has the name of the relation schema and the list of attributes, and we call this the heading. And then all of the other rows or all of the other tuples make up the body. And these are all the values for the attributes that are specified in the heading or in what we can call the relation schema. Then we have attributes that make up the columns. And we also kind of changed up our definition of degrees and cardinality. Whereas we had previously said the degree of a relation is the number of entities that are participating in that relation. We now say that the degree of a relation is the number of attributes in that relation. Okay, so in this case, three, because we have three attributes. And the cardinality, where we previously said it's either one or many, now we can a little, a little more specifically say that the cardinality is the number of tuples in the relation, in this case, five. And in this other relation, we have a, again a degree of three and a cardinality of four in this case because we just have the four tuples. Okay, so we talked about the degree of a relationship being the number of entities that are participating in the relationship but the degree of a relation is the number of attributes. And we gave this example that we could model any of our entities or any of our relations as just being uh, collections of individual entities or relations that contain only the one attribute and they're all in kind of a one-to-one -one relationship with one another to make up uh, this larger uh, concept of an entity or a relation. Okay. So this isn't a way we would ever model it, but this kind of describes or explains why we would consider the degree of a relation to be the number of attributes present in the relation. And then we further describe this by looking at the gerund. When we decompose a many-to-many -many relationship between two relations, well, we see the gerund is going to have a relation or a uh, degree of two, right? One attribute to represent each of the entities that's being uh, represented in this decomposed relationship. We also talked about our, uh, our keys, super keys, candidate keys, key attributes, non-key attributes, our primary key and alternate keys. And, uh, and the properties that are inherent in each one of these. So he says super keys have the property of uniqueness. They can uniquely identify tuples. And further, we said any superset of a super key is also a super key, right? So if I can uniquely identify you by your PeopleSoft ID, then that's going to be a super key because it's unique. But also PeopleSoft ID and your first name together is a super key or PeopleSoft ID and your gender would be a super key, right? Even though gender is not a very good way to identify someone, right? Because many people share the same genders, but once we have some unique identifier, we can add anything to that and it's still going to be unique, right? So we're gonna have a ton of super keys probably in our relation, but a candidate key gets to be a little bit more useful because it's a super key that is also irreducible. We can't take away any attributes from a candidate key and it still maintain the property of uniqueness, okay? So we're gonna have a much smaller number typically of candidate keys in a relation and the candidate keys are what we 
typically are going to use to uniquely identify tuples in our relation, okay? And then we're going to select just one candidate key to be our primary key. And to designate a candidate key as our primary key, we add the additional constraint that it cannot have any null values. And we call this the entity integrity constraint. We also talked about key attributes and non-key attributes. And we said a key attribute is a proper subset of a candidate key. Okay, so it's the constituent attributes that make up our candidate key. And a non-key attribute is any attribute that is not a subset of a candidate key. And as I just mentioned, primary key is the candidate key that in addition has the entity integrity constraint, meaning it cannot be null. And our alternate keys are any candidate keys that we did not select to be our primary key. Okay, so these were our, uh, our attribute level integrity constraints. And then we had some, uh, some binary integrity constraints that describe data integrity between two relations instead of just within one relation like our key constraints. So the referential integrity constraint simply says when a tuple in one relation refers to a tuple in another relation, it must be referring to a tuple that exists, right? We can't refer to something that is not there. And then the foreign key constraint, which is what allows us to establish relationships between relations. And we're going to see this in action in the second half of class tonight when we start actually looking at our SQL DDL code. But the foreign key constraint, just a special case of the referential integrity constraint, which says when we have a foreign key, all values of that foreign key attribute must be in the domain of values of the candidate key to which it refers, right? So we had this uh, example here of plants and projects, and project has a foreign key that refers to the plant that has undertaken that project, okay? So all values of this foreign key must be in the domain of values of the candidate key to which it refers, right? And we couldn't have a value here that is not in our plant relation, because then that tuple would be referring to a tuple that doesn't exist. And that's a violation of the referential integrity constraint, and more specifically, a violation of the foreign key constraint. Okay, and we call this inclusion dependency, when all values of an attribute must be in the domain of values of an attribute to which it refers. Okay, we also introduced a couple of our relational algebra operators like select and project. Select is going to return a subset of tuples that match some criteria, thereby resulting in a relation with a lower cardinality. Okay, and project is going to return a subset of attributes, thus uh, creating a new relation in memory that has a lower degree. Okay, so select and project are two ways that we can reduce the cardinality and the degree of relations. Uh, one, to make our reports a little bit more manageable and easy to read and, and show exactly what we need, nothing more, nothing less. But then also can reduce the computational complexity of doing joins on these relations going forward. So we're going to be doing a lot of selecting and projecting after spring break as we get more and more into SQL. We also talked about these three set theory operators of union, intersection, and difference. And we said that in order to use any of our set theory operators, our sets of data must be union compatible, which means they have the same degree or the same number of attributes, and that these pairs of attributes must be in the same domain. Okay, so these data sets that we're using set theory operators on really have to look pretty much the same. We need the same sets of attributes in these relations. Okay, and so if we had these two data sets, uh, this data set being made up of the attributes B and or the values B and C, and then this data set being made up of the values A and B, and you see we have a little overlap where this value B is in both data sets. The union is like the OR operator, and so the union of this, these two data sets AB and BC would be ABC. 
The intersection is like the AND operator. We want values that are in data set one and data set two. And in this case, that's going to be just B. And then the difference we can do in either direction or both directions at the same time and say the difference here would be either A if we were set two minus set one or C if we're set two minus set one minus set two or AC if we want uh, what we're going to come to call an outer join. Okay. So that's a quick review of our set theory. We also looked at join operations where we take two dissimilar relations and create a new relation based on values of two attributes being equal to one another, okay? And this is essentially what's happening in our foreign key relationship, right? So we've just created this new relation here based on the project AW plant number attribute in the projects table being equal to the AW plant number attribute in this AW plant table. Okay. And so now we have a new relation that has some attributes from both of the tables and joins are going to be something that we work with a lot in the second half of the semester when we start really looking at all of our SQL.